All right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to celebrate freedom, Lord, to, to celebrate the opportunity that we have to gather together freely, Lord, to worship you. We love you, and we pray that you would accept our worship, may it be beautiful to your ears, and I pray that you would help us to go forward and just see you in the day ahead of us. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 righteousness, your praises all day long. Psalm 35, 28.
the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Re Revelation 4, 8 through 11. <laughs> John Bowman, he's going to lead us through a special song today in honor of 4th of July, which we just celebrated this past week. He's going to sing for us, God Bless America. Bless America, land 
Amen. Amen is right. I love celebrating the 4th of July because it reminds me, yes, of our freedom, you know, as a country and, and all that that means. I mean, we are so free. We're so fortunate. We're blessed to be able to worship freely, to come into a place like this without fear of being arrested or, or worse. And, and we're, we're free to pray and we're free to share the gospel and, and just to live in a way that pleases God. Um, all of that's true. But then as I reflect on that, I think about, you know, the, the, the real freedom that we have in Christ, the freedom that we have from the bondage of sin, you know, and that we have been set free from that through the cross. And so I'm always reminded of that. And then I, th I think about our country right now and, and it's like, ugh, right? Like there's a lot of division. There's a lot of turmoil. 
and if you think about is how far we've come, where we've come from, our country is it's on a journey, but it's not over. Our country is still a country, the United States of America, and it's journeying. And we have an opportunity to journey well. And that's what I want to talk to you about over the next several weeks is we're going to be going through a series. It's called Summer in the Sand, which sounds great, right? Spending time on the beach in the summer, but that's not the kind of sand that we're talking about. We're talking about the wilderness and journeying through the wilderness. And through this series, we're going to look at a few different people and how they journeyed through the wilderness and what we can learn from them and from God as they made that journey. So we're starting with Abraham walked with God. Embrace the journey. Abraham walked with God. So we're going all the way back to Genesis, and we're going to look at this journey that Abraham made, which was quite significant and quite a long journey. But I want to just bring us back to, this is the story arc of the Bible that I brought up last week. And kind of just, when we look at the book of Genesis, and we look at Abraham's life in particular, where are we landing in the story arc of the Bible? So as you look at this graphic, we're going to be looking, we're in the nation of Israel, which is all the way at the top of the story arc. And then that has a story arc in and of itself, right? The patriarchs, the deliverance of the nation of Israel, the giving of the law, the entering into the promised land and taking ownership of it, the time of the judges, the kings, the divided kingdom exile, and then eventually the return. Today, in the book of Genesis, as we look at the life of Abraham and his journey, we're starting in the beginning of the story arc of the nation of Israel. So at this point in time, in the history of the world, God has not chosen Israel. He has not chosen them as a people out of the world. That's what he does through Abraham. And he calls Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to read it for you, Genesis 12, 1 through 5. And this is what it says. The Lord had said to Abram, so this is before God renamed him. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. I remember, I think it was like in the sixth or seventh grade, and uh, my dad decided to play hooky from work one day. We were living in South Carolina, and he came into my room in the morning before I was set to go to school, and he asked me if I wanted to play hooky and stay home with him. I was like, yeah, well, yeah, obviously. That's easy. So we stayed home together, and I didn't really know what the day was to hold or why he wanted to, to hang out and stay home, but I was glad to do it. And then he was like, get ready, we're going to get in the vehicle, and we're going to go somewhere. And that was all he said. So we got in the vehicle, we strapped in, and we headed down the road. I had no idea where I was going, but I was excited. And I was a little nervous. Like, who likes to go places where they don't know where they're going? Anybody in here okay with not having an itinerary? <laughs> yeah, most people like to have the itinerary. They like to know where they're going, right? What are you going to be doing when you get there? And all those different kinds of things. But in this moment, with my dad, we're going on this journey. I didn't know where it was going. But I had a feeling it was going to be good because I was with my dad, right? I had a feeling it was going to be good. And here we have God calling Abram out of his land, out of his father's household, away from his people to a place, God says, that I will show you. 
He doesn't even tell him where he's going. He just says, you're going to go to a place that I will show you. In other words, you're going to have to follow me because I'm going to show that place to you. At this point in time, Abram and his family are living in Haran. Well, God didn't actually only call Abram out of Haran. His call on Abram's life actually started even earlier. That's what we're told in the book of Acts. We're told that he was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Okay, so what is that? You know, I like context. I think it's important for us to understand where did Abram come from? Where did God actually call him out of? So he actually called Abram from Ur. And Ur, as you'll see on a map in a minute, was in Mesopotamia, in what's present-day Iraq. It was in the kingdom of Babylon at the time. So if I could kind of place things on the timeline in the Bible, the people came together in Babylon, they built the Tower of Babel, and they were doing it to make their names great, and so that God wouldn't scatter them, so that they wouldn't be scattered across the earth. God came in, he frustrated their plans, scattered them across the earth anyways. And now at this point in time, People are living in the land in Babylon, and God calls Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans. What you're looking at here is the great ziggurat. This is the great ziggurat, and it has been excavated. This is it in its present form today. This was built during the time of Abram. When he lived in Ur, he would have seen and probably worshipped at this ziggurat. Because that's what they were for. They were temples for worshiping. This is a picture of today of that same ziggurat. And as you can see here in the foreground, it's a city. It's the ruins of the city of Ur. And the ziggurat is actually directly in the center. This is a recreation of what the city probably looked like based on current excavations. So this is the land where Abram grew up, where Abram was probably born. His father, Terah, grew up here. And they didn't worship Yahweh, the God of the Bible, in Ur. They worshiped Nana. Not spelled, not spelled like that. Not, not you. No, they, they worshiped the God Nana, also known as, get this, Sin. That was the God's other name, Sin. In Ur, in the land of Babylon, they worshipped Sin, the God of the moon. Well, we're told in Genesis 11 that Terah, who is Abram's father, that he left Ur and went to Haran. We're not told why. We're just told that he did. So here's a map to give us some context. So Ur is down here in the corner. It's actually on the border of Iraq and Kuwait, near the Persian Gulf. And Haran is up in near the border of Syria and Turkey, present-day Syria and Turkey. And this is about 700 miles away. But Haran was actually a merchant colony of Ur. So it wasn't really that random that Terah would have decided to take his family from Ur to Haran because they were connected. And in Haran, they also worshipped the moon god Nana or Sin. So nothing changed for Abram's family when they left Ur and went to Haran. Haran is like a mini Ur. And there they worshipped the moon god Sin. This is a picture of present-day Haran up there in Syria. And it was here from Haran that Abram actually heard, we know for sure, heard the voice of God. And I just found all this to be interesting because in Acts, Stephen, the preacher, he says as he's being questioned by the religious leaders and they want to know, and they want him to stop talking about Jesus, he starts preaching the gospel, but he says that God called Abram, Abraham, out of Ur. So even before God actually spoke 
to Abraham, he was already working, right, through the life of his father to bring him to Haran. And then it was in Haran that God actually shows up and Abraham hears his voice. What a blessing that is to be able to hear so clearly the word of the Lord. And so this is a map of the trip that Abram and his family made from Haran down into Canaan, which is the light green shaded area. He goes into the land of Canaan. He settles in Shechem for a minute, and then he just takes a tour of the land. And as he's touring through the land, he's building altars. He's basically sanctifying the land for God as he goes through the land of Canaan. It's awesome. But I bring up this map to show that this is about a 600-ish mile journey itself. All in all, from Ur to Canaan, he traveled about anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 miles, depending on the exact route that he took, which probably went through the Fertile Crescent, we're told, which is pretty cool. This is the total of his journey, starting in Ur to Haran and then into the land of Canaan. And I just got to thinking, why? Why did Abram leave everything? Because remember, this is what it says when God calls him to go. He says, go from your country, go from your people, and your father's household. These aren't just random things that God is saying you need to go from. And this word go is pretty cool, actually. In the Hebrew, the word is halak. Let's say that together. Halak. One more time. Halak. Halak. And literally, this word, halak, it means to walk. To walk. But there is this, this other connotation to this word halak in the Hebrew language, and it has to deal with how one lives, how one behaves. To, to walk is to demonstrate your life. Your walk is a demonstration of who you are and how you live like walking the talk. That's the same idea here. So when God says go, he says walk away from your country, right? Your land, Haran, which is this merchant colony of Ur, which is one of the greatest cities in that time. Walk away from the land. Walk away from your people, aka your family, right? He has other relatives living there. And he has relatives that stay there. And he says, walk away from your father's household. That was huge. Because he was the rightful heir to everything that his father had. His father would live a little bit longer after he left Haran. If he would have stayed in Haran and stayed in his father's household, he would have inherited everything that belonged to his father. Being that they were Babylonian, from Ur, they were probably at least decently wealthy. We also know they were pretty wealthy because he left with stuff. Abram left with stuff. But what he left behind was security, identity, wealth. This was a scary thing for him to do, so why would he do it? Why would he leave all of that behind? And this isn't even his God. He grew up for 75 years worshiping Sin, the God of the moon. And it just had me wondering, why? And that had me thinking about my own self. Why did I choose to follow Jesus? Because Jesus gives us the exact same call. Jesus invites us to halak with him. He says, come, follow me. It's exactly what God said to Abraham. Go away from your people, your land, your father's household, to the land that I will show you. In other words, I'm going before you. Come and follow me. Halak with me. I'll never forget when I made the decision to halak with God. By placing my faith in Jesus on the back of the boat in the Coast Guard. I'll never forget it. And I did it because the grace of God compelled me to. The grace of God 
compels us to walk with him. God didn't have to choose Abram, but he did. He didn't have to choose anybody. He could have just blown the whole thing up and said, I'm done. Right? He created everything, Adam and Eve in the garden, everything's perfect, and sin enters the world through their poor decisions because they didn't trust God. Right? Well, he starts over, and he tries to do it all again. He, he destroys the world. He starts over with Noah. And then we have the Tower of Babel. It's like, gosh, God could have just, you know what, been done with us all. But by his grace, and his grace alone, he chose Abraham. And he pulled him out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Isn't that what Peter says, right? 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This call of God is so compelling. It calls us out of the land of sin and into the promised land, into a land where we can halak with God, which is what we were originally created to do. When God came into the garden in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, we are told that he was halaking in the cool of the day. He walked among us. He walked with us, and he desires to do that again with each and every one of us. So it's the grace of God, I believe, that compels us to walk with him. For me personally, when I was called to halak with God, I was in crisis. For 19 years, I lived a life of sin in darkness. But what was offered to me through the Gospels was a new life to come out of the darkness and to live in the light. And the call was so compelling. Jesus Christ, he took on flesh, fully God, fully man, and he died on a cross for my sins, for your sins, so that we might be set free from the bondage of sin. And then God raised him from the dead so that we might live forever with God. Wow. Like, come on. And that's what he's offering to Abraham. Because he doesn't just say go, right? He says to go and to, to leave, right? Everything behind. Your security, your identity, your family, your religion. Leave it all and come and follow me. But with that, he offers him blessings. He says, if you do this, I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. He asks Abram to leave behind three things, and then he blesses him with six things. Twice as much. Twice, as, twice the blessing to follow God, to halak with him. One of the things that we're going to look at through this series is when we choose to embrace the journey, right? Because it's a journey. It took Abram some time to get to the promised land. And then he moved around in it. I'm about to give away the end of the sermon. Whew, I don't want to do that. How do we journey well? How do we journey well? That's what we're going to look at as we look at all these different people who journey in the wilderness with God. And I think from Abraham's story, one thing that we can see is that walking with God requires sacrifice. Again, think about everything that he had to give up. So when he traveled from Ur to Haran, as he was making his journey, he went through Babylon and he went through all the towns of the Babylonian kingdom and he got to see the wealth every step of the way, all along the way. But from Haran to Canaan, it was like a wilderness. He began to see everything else just kind of disappear. The only thing that he had as he walked with God 
was his wife, his nephew, some of the cattle that he had, and a promise. Hope. Hope in a promise from God. That's all he had. It requires great sacrifice for us to halak with God. When we choose to place our faith in Jesus, we're not just walking towards God, we're walking away from everything in that old way of living. All those things that we once held dear. And yes, sometimes that might even be our family who may not be halaking with God. So walking with God absolutely requires sacrifice. Walking with God also requires trust. So it took great trust for Abraham, who worshipped sin for 75 years of his life and now is being confronted by Yahweh, the one true living God, a God that he really doesn't know. He's trusting him with his life, with his identity, with his everything, to follow him. And something about Abraham that's, that's interesting, because we hear a lot about Abraham in the New Testament and how you know, he was a righteous man, and his righteousness was credited to him because of his faith. He was a man of faith, a man of trust. Yes, all that's true, but he was not perfect. In fact, he goes into the land. He settles in Shechem for a minute. He builds an altar there. He has this, another revelation of God. God meets him there, and he talks to him, and he says, this is all going to be yours. Shortly after that, a famine hits the land. What does he do? He leaves. He leaves the promised land. This happens another time in the book of Genesis. Later on, in Jacob's life, Jacob is living with his family in the promised land. A famine hits the land. Joseph, his son, is in Egypt. We know this, right? Everything's there, prepared. There's food in the land. Jacob's wrestling with whether or not to go, and God comes to Jacob and he says, it's okay, go. He doesn't say that to Abraham. He doesn't say, yeah, there's famine in the land. It's okay, go to Egypt. Abraham goes to Egypt, and when he's there, as he's entering into Egypt, it suddenly strikes him that his wife is very beautiful, and uh, some men there might want to take her to be with themselves and kill him. So he says, let's just tell everybody that you're my sister. Wow. Because if you're my sister, well, then they'll negotiate with me, and they won't kill me, and they can have you. And that's exactly what happens. Pharaoh takes Sarah to be his wife. Yes, that's, that means what you think it means. That's what Abraham was willing to do because he's like, well, I'm going to die. And if I die, I'm just thinking, this is just BJ. If I die, well, then how's God going to bless me? How's he going to fulfill his promise if I'm dead? It's like he doesn't really trust God to provide, to bless, to take care of him. So he's willing to give up his wife, and he does. Even still, God shows up. Right? God is still with him. God's still halaking with him. And guess what he does? This is great. He sends plagues to Egypt. That's familiar. Mm-hmm. He sends plagues to Egypt, and Pharaoh's like, whoa, what's going on here? And he confronts Abraham, and Abraham's like, oh yeah, that's actually my wife. So he's like, well, you need to take everything because you brought curse upon our land. Here, have all of our stuff and leave. So Abraham walks away a rich and more wealthy man, even after not fully trusting in God. Wow, God is so good. He is so good. We don't deserve any of it, and he just gives us even more. Did he get him his wife too? He got his wife back. He got his wife back. Yep. So he goes back into the land. And then he has this another revelatory experience with God. This time, God like, actually shows up in person as three men. Interesting. Oh, man. I could just do a whole series on Abraham. He's so good. He's so good. But anyways, what we come to learn throughout his journey is that walking with God requires trust. And I think what's cool about Abraham's life, and it's a demonstration for us, is that he learns to trust God along the way because he keeps messing up. He messes up more than once, but eventually it all kind of seems to click for him and he fully trusts 
in God. I think it's the same thing for us, right? When we're called to halak with God, when we enter in a relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ, like we have to learn to trust God. We are fortunate that we have the revelation of scripture. We can look back at all that God has already done, right? But then I think it's important as we continue to journey with God, continue to walk with him, that we continue to look back and see all that he's done for us. Because sometimes it can be, you know, when, we, when we're living and, and we're worried and, and different things are happening in our lives, we, we might forget all that he's done. So we remember. And as we remember, that just builds trust, right? We can trust him, which is an absolute re- requirement of walking with him. And then kind of in alignment with that is that walking with God requires commitment. So he sends there in Egypt, he comes back and, and God blesses him and he, he makes a covenant with him. And then, well, he doesn't trust God again. And him and his wife, Sarah, decide that, you know, they haven't had a child yet. And God's saying that you're going to have like all of these in, you know, offspring and you're, they're going to fill the land. They're going to be like the dust in the land. There's going to be so many. But he doesn't even have a child yet. So Abraham and Sarah plot to have their own child a different way. So an Egyptian slave is in the household. Her name is Hagar, and Sarah gives Hagar to Abraham to make a baby, and they do. And he's born, and his name is Ishmael. And immediately there becomes division in the family. So Abraham has to suffer the consequences of his poor decisions and his poor choices, but God continues to halak with him. He still continues to walk with him. He actually ends up blessing Ishmael, saying he will also be a great nation, but he is not the one that I have chosen to bring the promised seed into the world, to bring the Messiah into the world. He's not the one, but I'm still going to bless him, and I'm still going to make him a great nation. Wow, God is so good, like even in the midst of failure and lack of trust. And then after that, Abraham recommits his life again, and God cuts another covenant with them the covenant of circumcision. Isn't that ironic? Through the fruit of his loins, he sins and Ishmael is born. And then God cuts a covenant with him by circumcising his loins. It's like, it's it's crazy, right? Sanctification, return, recommitment, back to God. He keeps turning back to God every step of the way. And that's what commitment's all about. Commitment's not about perfection. It's about a continual pursuit because this side of heaven, we're never going to be perfect. We're all going to mess up. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to go off on our own. We're going to, you know, not travel the path that God has laid out for us. That's going to happen. It's not going to be perfect, but it's about the pursuit of that relationship, staying committed to him. So while he might abandon God's plans for him, And he's doing so really because he just doesn't fully trust God yet along the way. While he doesn't abandon God's, while he abandons God's plan, he never abandons God. And God never abandons him because God chose him. He made a promise and our God is faithful. We can trust him. We can stay committed to him. And then through it all, if we walk with God, right, if we halak with him, we will experience blessing. We will. If you look through scripture, it happens time and time again. As you look at Abram's life, we've already looked at some of it. Even when he messes up, God continues to bless him. And in the end, I think this is so neat. In the end, so this is, this is actually the location of the cave of Metpalah which is the cave that Abraham bought to bury his wife, Sarah, when she died. And it's in the city of Hebron, which is in the promised land. So when Sarah passes away, so they, you know, they have their child, Isaac, and they live for a while. Sarah passes away. Abraham buys a plot of ground in the promised land. And they bury Sarah there. And then after he dies, Ishmael and Isaac, bury him there in this cave in Hebron. So my, what my point is, is that God said that you will inherit the land. And here in his dying day, his one possession in the promised land is his burial ground. 
It's like a, it's like a down payment on the blessing. He doesn't see it. He doesn't see his family inheriting the promised land. They own nothing but this burial plot. But that burial plot's a down payment on the blessing that's to come. It's like the Holy Spirit. When we choose to place our faith in Jesus, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's a down payment on everything that's to come. He marks us, he seals us for what's to come. Right? That's so cool. So walking with God leads to blessing. And if I come back to the story of my dad taking me on a road trip, a little mini journey after playing hooky from school and from work, we end up at a restaurant. He takes me to a restaurant, a Japanese restaurant, a sushi bar. And together, we tried sushi for the first time. And it's a memory that will always live with me. Well, it was the destination, it was okay, right? Like a restaurant, eating sushi. The destination was, it was good. The sushi was good. But the real blessing was the time that I got to spend with my dad. So embrace the journey. I think that's the part of the point of Abraham's life, right? He never really knew what the final destination was. He didn't really know what it was going to look like. And yes, our final destination is going to be great. It's going to be even better than we can imagine. But let us not look so far down the road that we miss everything that's happening in the journey. Spending time with our Father, right? Journeying well with Abba, with our dad. That's what it's all about. And as we do that, right, we'll come to know him better. We'll come to trust him better, right? We'll, we'll be better able to be used by him for his glory and for his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so in a moment, we're going to move forward uh, with communion. It's a communion Sunday. And as we do this, this is just a reflection, a remembrance of all that God gave so that we might be able to halak with him, that we might be able to walk with him, and that we also might have a final destination where we would spend eternity with him, where we could halak together in the cool of the day. How awesome is that? That's something to look forward to. And this act that we're about to partake in of communion is just helps us to remember and reflect what that cost, because it costs something. It costs Jesus everything. So the cracker, when we eat it, that represents his body. That was broken, beaten, spit on, flogged, right, for us. And the cup, it represents his blood that was poured out for us and for the forgiveness of our sins. So this morning, as you prepare your hearts and your minds to receive, just think about all that he's done to make halakhing with God possible. And then, as always, we'll just do it like we normally do. We'll start with, on my left, when you're ready, you can come forward to receive the elements and then just hold on to them. And then once everybody has the elements, we'll partake together. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your word and just all the ways that um, you reveal yourself to us through Scripture. This morning, Lord, I want to thank you for the way that you reveal your faithfulness to us through the life of Abraham, who you chose out of darkness, out of the land of sin, and into the promised land. Not because he was anything special, but because you chose, because you love, because of your grace. In the same way, Lord, we just thank you so much for choosing to send Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. And we thank you that you raised him from the dead to conquer death on our behalf so that we might live eternally with you and that we might be able to walk with you well, journey well with you here in this life. We pray for your blessings upon the elements, Lord. Help us to set aside any distractions, anything that might be getting in the way as we focus this time on your son and his sacrifice. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please?
On the night that he was betrayed, after he had given thanks, Jesus took the bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, This is my body, which is given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may eat. And in the same way, after supper, when he had given thanks, he took the cup, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may drink. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you so much for the gift of this day. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We also thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we would live in a way that pleases you, that we would journey well, that we would walk well with you this week, all for your glory to point people to your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.